Hello everyone and welcome to the World Class Dan podcast. Special guest today is an Aston Villa fan, Nick Sanders, and he runs his own podcast. Nick, can you just tell us a little bit about your podcast and, and where people can find you on X, formerly known as Twitter? Yeah, first off, thanks for having us on, guys. Really looking forward to it. I've been listening to the last few weeks, so it's something I've been uh, counting down to today to get me through the working day. Um, yeah, so I run a, a podcast called the avillafan.com podcast. Um, on Twitter, it can be found under the tag at avillafanpod um, and at avillafan. That's our website where we do um, written articles, match previews. We talk about what's going on with Villa, topical debates. Um, we're also one of the um, members of the fan advisory board within the club, so we, we meet with the club regularly. We get to make decisions and things based on what the support as one um but our podcast a little bit different to sort of the normal um run of the mill podcast in that we're, we're more like a football phone in type thing we um like to get people to come on and shape the podcast with their views on what's going on the pitch what's going on off the pitch um and then be able to feed that back to the club directly as well stuff um so our podcast is all about world-class players and and what a world-class player actually is so in your uh, opinion what is it that your definition of world-class player I've heard some of the, the previous people that have come on here to try and sort of put it into words. It's a really difficult thing. I think everybody said the same thing. It's trying to sort of, it's such a finite thing to try and directly explain. And I think I've, I've probably changed my definition of this week by week as I've tried to, to work it out. Um, I've sort of settled for saying it's sort of a player for me that would be able to fit into to any team, but still be able to perform to their best um, and therefore bring an improvement to any team. You, you drop a player in at any club across Europe, anywhere across the world, and they're going to have an impact on that team and they're still going to be able to play the way that they play. Um, to then separate that pool of players, because it is going to be a big pool, um, you can start to look at things like their honours, their accolades, but I don't think trophies necessarily have to be the heaviest weight in. I think if you look at players like um, Harry Kane, for instance, obviously it looks like he's going to win something this year, um, but yeah, I think we'd all agree, world-class striker, scores goals, left, right, centre, wherever he goes. Um, hasn't won anything up to this point. I think Alan Shearer, another one, won Premier League title for somebody that everybody would agree was a world-class player. So um, difficult thing to sort of pinpoint, but I'd probably say it is somebody that would make a massive difference to any club that they join, regardless of level. Interesting. You mentioned Alan Shearer. Um, <laughs> yeah. We recently went down to Southampton and, and interviewed Matt Letissier, and uh, we asked him, if Matt, uh, Alan Shearer was in his best ever 11, but he didn't give him the world-class stamp. So uh, yeah. very high standards so, yeah. from Matt this year. Debatable. I know. It's, uh, it's a <laughs> yeah. standard of a, a pro footballer, I think, coming through there. A very high standard, yeah. obviously. I think he tended to lean towards more players, um, you know, who were skillful. Like Dennis Burkamp is one that you have to work class down to. And um, players that he would actually pay himself to go and watch. I suppose maybe that's a higher bar for the, the pros to actually go and get their money out and spend a few quid on a player. But uh, yeah, uh, controversial. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you got some, on, isn't it? it is. You got some names to throw out just to give us a bit of an idea of the levels you're talking about here. Oh, wow. Um, well, I actually made a couple of notes of players that for me, people probably wouldn't. Well, first off, I hope you, you know who I'm going to talk about because it's going back a while, this first player. But um, players for me that probably don't get that recognition of being world class for. First off, not winning trophies. I think, I don't know if any of you remember early 90s, Football Italia that used to be on Channel 4, used to be an absolute staple. A Sunday afternoon, you'd have your roast dinner, oh, you'd yeah. race to get it down, you'd yeah. go and lock yourself in the lounge and watch the Football <laughs> well Italia. Um, and Giuseppe Signori, for me, was one of the first players I remember oh, growing yeah. up watching. Um, absolute legend in Italian football. There's been books, documentaries, all sorts about him. Um, but I think if you actually dig into his career and you look at him, not only was he sort of that unique player that stood out every week with scoring goals from all over the park, um, more than 250 goals during his career. Um, also scored 12, I think it was 12 times for Italy, but including in the 1994 World Cup, he scored in six of Italy's seven matches. They obviously ended up losing on penalties in the final. So to score in every single round of the World Cup, bar the one, which was the final, um, believe he scored his penalty in the shootout as well. Um, people might argue that he wasn't world class because he didn't go on and win things, but again, had an impact in every club that he played for. Um, if we're talking about players now, I think the generation that we're in probably changes what world class means now as well. I think there's this sort of clamour through FIFA and Football Manager and everything else. I think Messi and Ronaldo are your obvious two that stand out. Um, but for me, I think it's any player that can consistently do it in different leagues. I think Aguero was one for me. I think arguably one of the best strikers I've seen in the Premier League. Um, going back a few years, I think my ultimate, if I had to pick an ultimate sort of 11, um, particularly thinking forward line players, players like Thierry Omri. I mean, for me, the, there's never been a player that's graced the league the way that he did. Um, going back even a little bit further than that, players like Gianfranco Zola, somebody that's so small physically, yeah. 
wouldn't be able to do what he could do in the Premier League, but he was doing it week in, week out, right into his late 30s. Yeah, top names there, definitely. I remember Giuseppe Signori, uh, Lazio, wasn't he? Um, That's the one. Spent quite a lot of his career there, yeah. Um, I actually, as a young kid, got into like a, a male order fancy football league, and I actually had Lazio as my team. So uh, Giuseppe Signori was banging the goals in for me uh, when I was doing that sort of male order fancy football years and years ago. So, yeah. I remember him. Italian league for for people who, who can't remember sort of football Italia on a Sunday, it was the league. I mean, it was yeah. right ahead of its time. It's probably what the Premier League is now. It was probably the equivalent, but back yeah. then without the media coverage that we get over here. Yeah, you had uh, players bringing that league. So, Del Piero, uh, he was uh, top of his game for Juventus. Uh, yeah, you had top class defenders over there. Nesta, Maldini, a lot. It was it was the actual um, league of the early nineties. To be honest. Yeah, we even had players from England going over there, like Paul Lintz, uh, like Gaza. You know, so the best of the best from the English game were going over to test themselves as well. Um, so so um, I'm not sure how long you've been watching Aston Villa, but um, can you give us your best ever eleven um, since the Premier League era, so the past 30-odd years? Um, who, who is your, your 1-11 to for Aston Villa? You've had some great players over the years, so I'd imagine it's quite difficult to choose. But uh, yeah, and especially this season is probably one of the most exciting ever seasons it's been so far. Yeah, it's it's, it's been a, a difficult task looking at this. And I think I've chopped and changed it many a time, even texting other people saying, what do you think of this and whatever else. And the list of players that didn't quite make it, you could make three or four 11s out of them. It's been ridiculous. I think one thing I've tried to do is I've tried to avoid picking players on the whole um, that are in the current squad, simply because I think if you were to ask me this in 12, 18 months time, which... I'm sure we'll allude to later on. I do think there'll be a couple of those players dropping in. I think they're, I've been going down since 1994, so quite early on in the Premier League sort of era. Um, I've had the same season ticket, same seat since that point. Um, and for me, where we are currently at the moment is, as you say, it's probably the most exciting that I've known as a Villa fan in that I feel like we can genuinely play against anybody, particularly at home. Um, Manager-wise, if we get on to mention that later on, I'd, I'd quite easily argue probably the best manager that we've had in the time that I've supported the club already. Um, his stats back that up and you look at what he's done elsewhere. But in terms of a 1-11, to 11, um, although I said I wasn't going to pick people from the current team, a number one is going to be my contradiction. Um, I was torn between three keepers. It was either going to be Mark Bosnich, Brad Friedel um, or Emmy Martinez. And I think the fact that Martinez has done what he's done after being written off at Arsenal... Um, you know, he's fought, he managed to come away from that, the adversity that he had there. Um, he's gone on to win a Copa America with Argentina, their first title in any form for a long time. Um, and then obviously winning the World Cup and making the save that, for me, embodies everything that's about Emi Martinez. He does have his mad moments, like I think any keeper does. I think it's that one position where you're bound to make mistakes. But to make a save like that when it's a crucial clutch moment and make saves in penalty shootouts and so on, I just think he's a massive player. And somebody that we've missed in that he's got that silly streak to him, that nasty streak. He knows how to get under the skin of the fans, the opposition. And we've always been, in my sort of lifetime, too nice. We've never had that player that knows how to play a little bit of gamesmanship. Um, but Martinez would be my keeper for sure for number one. Uh, he's had 70% save ratio this season. Uh, kept four clean sheets. And yeah, he doesn't take no uh, no mess with, does he? Not at all. I don't know if you saw the Brazil game the other week when he was actually climbing in the yeah. crowd to try and fight with the police because they were attacking their own fans. And you just think, <laughs> the guy's nuts. And I think from a selfish point of view, I stayed up to watch it. I love South American football. I could go on about that for a whole hour. Um, but for me, I think it was just the fact that we were watching this guy jumping in. I was thinking, if he gets suspended, selfishly, I was thinking, never mind the people in the crowd. Like, if we lose you, we're in big trouble. And that's one thing I would say about our season. Martinez is our number one player for a reason this year. And if he gets injured, I do worry about what we've got backing us up. And it could be genuinely a tipping point for the entire season. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an Arsenal fan. I'll, uh, I'll let you know that straight up. And I was, uh, he came into the, he came into the Arsenal team, didn't he, at the back end of his Arsenal career, and he, I thought he'd done amazing. And I was quite surprised he moved on. Um, and every keeper we've had since Arsenal has, has not hit the levels um, that Martinez is hitting. So I think uh, we've got one massively wrong in letting Martinez go. Yeah, they still can't. Yeah, uh, interested to see how far he can take it. Yeah. OK, for, so for your defenders, who have you got in for your back line? I, again, formation, I tried to play around with that. I'm one of these people that tries to fit in the players that I want to fit in, but then I did go back to sticking with the 4 4 I think it's probably the fairest way of doing it. Um, defenders that sort of just missed out at the likes of Hugo Hiago, who's a legend at the Villa, um, Steve Staunton, Wilfred Boomer at left-back, 
In terms of like modern day squad, I think Tyro Mings needs to mention for the fact that he's been with us all the way through the climb back up from the championship. I don't think people realise just how close we were to going under. Um, and Esri Konza at the moment doesn't get the accolades that he deserves. <laughs> Excuse me. In terms of the four that I went with, I went with Mark Delaney at right back. Um, right back's been a position that we've struggled notoriously with. Um, but he was probably our most consistent player in the era of me following the club. Um, it was really unfortunate with injuries. And if you look at his performance level and the sort of things he was doing with Villa and regularly winning man of the matches and so on, um, could have been a lot bigger for the club, but just unfortunately he suffered the injuries that he did and ended up having to go into coaching as a result. Um, next to him, I caught the f- my first two or three years of supporting Villa. I was fortunate enough to see Paul McGrath. Um, if you ask any Villa fan that has supported the club for sort of more than 25 years, Paul McGrath came top as a poll in terms of the all-time legends of Aston Villa. He's just embodied so much about the club. You read stories about him. This is a guy that got into all sorts of issues with alcohol and other stuff um, to the point where he couldn't train of a, of a week because he was in such a state, but that he'd come on the pitch on a Saturday after no training. Knees were shot. He'd probably been on a couple of sessions and whatever else, and then he'd turn up and be man of the match every single week against the best teams. And you only have to listen to some of the ex-managers that work with him and ex-players and they just wax lyrical about what an ultimate professional he was on the on a, on a match day. Um, and a really lovely guy as well who still sort of keeps in touch with the club and the fans. Um, next to him, I went Martin Lawson. Um, it was a sort of toss-up between him and Olaf Malberg. Um, but for me, Martin Lawson, when he signed him for £3 million, it was one of the few things that David O'Leary did at Villa that was a, a positive. Um, but £3 million bought us a player that was player of the year within 12 months of getting there. Um, came from AC Milan with a history of knee problems. Um, unfortunately again suffered a couple of those and that was ultimately the end of um, his time at the Villa but every time he put a Villa shirt on gave 110% and it was in that era when we got Martin O'Neill in charge and we were pushing for Europe year after year um, remember him scoring against Ajax at Villa Park which was our first game in Europe for some time and the atmosphere was just different level and then just scrolling down through my list my fourth defender I did actually put Malberg back in in the end after taking him out um, more for sort of the cult hero status um, Ask any Villa fan that grew up in that era again. Everybody loved Olaf Malberg. He hated Birmingham City. Um, remember his last game when he announced he was leaving to go to Juventus. He um, he got subbed at 5-1 up and he literally looked at all four stands before looking at the Blues fans and really punched in the air. And it was one of those iconic photos that everybody remembers it. Everyone was there. Um, but a real solid bat line. Okay. Um, no Gareth Southgate in there? That's, uh, that's one of the ones I thought maybe... It, it's it's a love-hate relationship with Villa fans and Gareth Southgate, as it is with many people. As a, as a player, brilliant player in his time, he was captain of the club, can't fault him. Um, I think maybe certain recent events have maybe tarnished that a little bit. Um, right. But I just think out of the list of players that I've got down, he wasn't quite there for me in terms of some of the names I've mentioned. Yeah, yeah some great club legends. I'm a Cardiff City fan, so uh, uh, you mentioned Mark Delaney. I stole him out of Cardiff City for... I think it was something like uh, 300,000. It might have no, been, he was pennies basically. But um, yeah, he could have went on to be one of the the great left right backs. But um, unfortunately, like you said, injuries really did uh, cut short his, his career, so which is unfortunate. Um, yeah, some uh, great players. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, Marcy? you're right there. With, with the uh, Glenn McGrath being a club legend, I've heard so many ex pros sticking him in their top 11. And you're talking, I think Gary Lineker put him in his top 11 over. Players that have ever played in the Premier League over John Terry, Van Dyke, and he's put him as his, his centre back. So didn't get to see him play as much uh, as as you know the current players or when I was growing up because uh, maybe the early nineties was just as I was getting to football when I was younger. But um, yeah, he's definitely you know he's definitely there. Maybe getting the world class stamp. I hope so, because uh, I say absolute consummate professional in terms of match days. And one last little story about him. If you, you read about Jim Walker, who's physio of the Villa for we're talking a couple of decades, he was having to actually sleep outside Paul McGrath's room in the hotel. He used to put his mattress out in the in the corridor because they were so worried about him getting up in the middle of the night and getting up to antics and whatever else. And he was literally being paid to sleep outside of his room to make sure that he was in a state to play in the game on a Saturday, which shows just how much they wanted to wrap him up in cotton wool. Yeah, wow. <laughs> There's a few players oh, like that, in that era, wasn't there? Yeah. Gaza was another one, wasn't he? Um, went a bit off the rails. Adams. That era was just a big era of football and a lot of other stuff going on, wasn't there? Social lives. Brilliant years, early 90s. Oh, yeah. That's where love football <laughs> came from. <laughs> yeah. So uh, moving into your midfield then, who are your four midfielders? Um, a few people might question this because there's a couple of names in there that might be a little bit iffy, but also in terms of trying to fit them into certain positions because you've got a couple of duplicates. But again, for me, I've just gone on what I think were the four midfielders that stood out for me for consistent ability, but also what we saw as being unique ability. 
Um, one of the names in particular is the one that's going to be the sort of 50-50. So Ashley Young was definitely straight in there. Um, his time at Villa, two stints at Villa when he came back. Um, I think we were a little bit surprised when he came back because sort of 35, 36. We didn't realise just how good he still was when he came back from Inter Milan. I mean, last year, um, phenomenal for us. We were, we were a little bit disappointed he wasn't kept on for another year just because of how good he was. And he could quite easily have been player of the year last year in that he had to fill in by nearly 90 minutes every single week at the age that he was. I think the performance last year that stood out for me was um, when Phil Foden came on against Man City at home. I was thinking Phil Foden playing down the left against Ashley Young, this could be like nasty to watch. Literally won every single ball off him. He stood five, ten yards off him. Positional sense was phenomenal. Um, when he first played for Villa, he was more of an attacking player. Um, chipped in with loads of goals and assists. Um, and we were all... I think the, it was a real devastation when he left to go to Man United. And I think the fact that that was felt throughout the fan base. Everybody really loved the guy. Um, so he would be definitely in there. Um, I went with Gareth Barry. I think there was... Talking about players that have left. I think all four that I've got here have left under certain circumstances. But... Um, Barry made so many four, uh, appearances for Villa. He was always that player that sort of dug us out when we were in a rut um, and then went all the way through to when we were playing in Europe. He was one of our best players. And again, when he left for Man City, before they hit that peak of being the sort of team that they were, um, we were absolutely devastated. We thought he was going to be almost like a one-club man and play all the way through with us. Um, the one that I think will be the controversial one, I've put Jack Grealish in there. Um, I toyed with several different names like Paul, Paul Merson, Ian Taylor, um, Tony Daly, Andy Townsend I'll go all the way through even to modern players like John McGinn who I think in 18 months time would be in my list um, and Dougie Louise who I don't think people realise just how big he is for us at the moment but Grealish the years that we had him completely different player to what you see at Man City and whilst he's got to fit the system of what Pep wants I don't think supporters of clubs outside of Villa fully truly appreciate how good he was for Villa in our season getting up and then staying in the Premier League he was an absolute maverick um, the only player I've probably seen in my lifetime that but practically had the freedom of being given the ball and being left to get on with it because he was just that good. Um, during the lockdown period, unfortunately, we didn't get to go and see the games live in terms of what he was doing. Um, but I think of results like the 7-2 against Liverpool. I think he got some like three assists in that game, scored in that game, hit the post. And he was doing that week in, week out against some of the top teams. Um, and then my final one, I went with James Milner. Um, he had a couple of stints on loan at Villa and then came permanently. And again, the day left. The whole end was good. I remember he actually, I think he scored. We went 3-0 up against, I believe it was Hull or West Ham. Um, and the way he left, he literally got subbed, came up to the whole end, threw his shirt and his boots into the crowd mid-game. And it was just somebody that's always going to have a, a sort of open door at Villa Park. Um, some cracking midfielders there. Um, Matt, Steve, any thoughts on, on those or any honourable mentions yeah. you think you'd uh, like to shout out? You've gone for a straight-up English midfield there, haven't you? Um, <laughs> Villa. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jack Grealish. I think I'll focus on him a little bit. He, for me, at Villa, he was like the what Matt Letizia was at Southampton. I think wasn't he? I think the team was just built around him, like you say, giving the ball, and he had the freedom to do what he wanted to do, and he's done, done some amazing, amazing things. Um, so yeah, absolute top player. Yeah, it's, he seems very restricted at City, doesn't he? Um, more team play there. He's not allowed to express himself as much as I'm sure he would love love to. Um, but no, that's a, a solid midfield. Quite surprised with James Milner, actually. Um, I don't know why. I just wasn't expecting that name to, to slide in there. Yeah, um, He's got a real affinity at the Villa. I think I think the three stints he had with us, we practically every single game, you were getting a minimum of an 8 out of 10 from him. Um, scored some big goals for us as well. Um, just... I don't know what it is, it's just a consummate professional again. I think you look at what he's done at other clubs as well. When he went to Man City, a few people to raise their eyebrows going, oh, why has he gone there? Repeatedly getting in that starting eleven, winning trophies, goes to Liverpool at an old age, you think he's finished, wins the league with Liverpool. Um, he's just yeah. been Mr. Consistent. And I think, I believe he's, he's at Brighton, isn't he now? And he just thinks to himself, he could probably play another two or three years in the Premier with some of the lower teams and still do a job. Yeah. He's, he's just one of those. Yeah, well, I think all your midfield is sort of evergreen there. You've got Ashley Young still going. Fantastic player. Gareth Barry, I think the most appearances in Premier League history. James Milner. You know, they, they come through when that Martin O'Neill side was really cemented together. And unfortunately, that side broke up. So I think it's a case of what could have been with those players or what they've gone on to achieve. Um, but my midfield is pretty much what you've chosen. <laughs> I like put Milner in, Barry Grealish, I like put uh, Ashley Young. Uh, Stylian Petrov, does he get an honourable mention? Yeah, he, he was sort of on the periphery. Um, I think Petrov's a funny one in that when he first joined, I think the first year he was a good example of a player that needs time to bed in. Um, his first year coming out from Celtic wasn't really 
as strong as we'd sort of expected. And then it was really that second year where we really kicked in and off the back of that became a sort of first name on the team sheet. And then unfortunately got the, um, the illness that he did, which it, it's been amazing to see him fight back from that because, you know, I think we're all fearing the worst. Um, massive outpouring, still got a lot of links with the club again. He, he's a regular a, attendee at the club. Um, and I believe he's playing local football just up the road from me. He still plays Sunday League football, oh, yeah. a lot of um, charity-based football as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it'd have been on the periphery, but I, I just think in terms of longevity at the club and yeah. what I saw from the other four, they probably just beat him to it. I, okay. I've got another thing to throw in here, into midfield, um, and I'm not sure whether how good he was, to be honest. From what I saw of him, he seemed a pretty you know decent player. Right? I think he's wasting his play on the bench elsewhere now. Fabian Delph um, was a bit of a... One or two season wonder got sold and never really performed again. I, I loved Alf when he signed. I, I genuinely I remember having his name put on the back of the shirt the day he signed, and I used to I used to lynch onto the odd player. I've got a really bad history of, of getting players on the back and they're being useless or leaving <laughs> or something going on. Um, I got Delph on the back. I, I had good friends that were Leeds fans, and that's one of the reasons why I had it on the back just to wind them up. But um, when he joined Villa, I remember his debut. He played a pre-season friendly against uh, Fiorentina. And I was thinking they'll, they'll probably bring a second string over and they bought the full whack. They've got like Giladino up front. Um, They've got a lot of sort of big names from the Italian first team. Um, And he was man of the match. And off the back of there, he was solid, did a lot of good things. But towards the end, I think more than anything, I think the way he left soured a lot of the good memories of what he did for Villa. Another player, I think probably unfortunately, was at Villa at the wrong time. Had he, had he been under that O'Neill team that you mentioned, and it was right at the start of the O'Neill era, he would have been right in there. Um, but I think when we had the likes of Paul Lambert and Alex McLeish and I could go on about some of the terrible managers we've had, unfortunately the team was always being eroded away and it was sort of Delph being that one to keep our head above water but never really kick on from there. But yeah, when we first signed him, brilliant player, but I think he didn't quite capture the heights of what he could have done. Okay, um, moving on to your strikers then. Who is your friend too? That's some excellent strikers over the uh, years. This, this was the hardest one for me. Real hard one. Um, I think, again, if you ask me in 12, 18 months' time, I genuinely think Ollie Watkins will be in there because when he first signed, I was one that was a bit sort of jury's out. I don't see him as a centre-forward. I see him as more of somebody that cuts in from the left, which he was doing at Brentford under Dean Smith. Um, but I've never seen a striker that we've had in my memory work as hard as he does off the ball, um, contribute so much to the team, doesn't get enough accolades in terms of the assists that he gets. Um, but also a genuinely lovely guy as well, which I know might, might not be a big accolade for other people and whatever else, but I think it's important to have that affinity with the fans. He's a, he's a real family man. You don't see his name in the papers for the wrong things. Um, other names I put in there, Dean Saunders, who was the first name I ever had on the back of a Villa shirt. Um, Dalian Atkinson, who played with him, scored probably the best goal we've ever seen in a Villa shirt in the Premier League against Wimbledon, where he, I think was up for Premier League goal of the year, 92-93. Um, Dion Dublin, another class player for us, great professional, great attitude. Um, and then one Pablo Angel, but the two I went with, um, I went with Dwight York growing up, scored nearly every single week. I just remember um, practically every time my dad took me to any game home or away, Dwight York would be the first goal scorer. Um, really good in set pieces in terms of penalties. Don't really remember him missing any penalties for us. I remember him um, taking a penalty against David Seaman, the year Arsenal won the league, and it was the, the rudest penalty you've ever seen. It was a proper Penenka, but it was that slow. You, you actually watch the video back, you see Seaman dives to his one side. And he knows in his face that he's been done and he's laughing as he goes down and he probably had time to get up <laughs> and dive again and it still beat him. It's just one of those penalties that you watch back and you have the memories from it. Um, and then the other one who didn't quite cut it elsewhere, but for us, he was an absolute colossal striker, Christian Benteke. Um, if you look at his goal scoring record for Villa, um, he's actually got the highest goals to games ratio of any striker at Villa in the Premier League era. Um, in terms of goals scored for Villa in the Premier League era, I think he's got the, I believe he's third-ish. I think, I think Watkins is quite close to him. Um, but I think Ben Teke and York, if you put those two together in a team, it would have been a frightening partnership. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. Some good uh, strikers there. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure I can think of any um, outside of the ones I you can. mentioned that could push. Go on, Steve. I can. Yeah. Gabby Agbong Lahore. Um, yeah. Is he, is he not your <laughs> all time assist and top goal scorer? Oh, no. Do you listen to talk sport as well? Uh, it drives me nuts every single morning when he comes on and they, they give out. Joe, this is why we're desperate for Watkins to stay, even if he goes really poor, yeah. just so we can break that record. And we haven't got to listen to that really annoying introduction every morning that he's Villa's all time record Premier League goal scorer. When you've played 500 games for Villa or whatever it is that he's played, yeah. and he's scored an average of a goal every 24 hours, you know what I mean? It's, it's a bit different. I think you look at Watkins and he's set to beat it. You know, I think he's only been at the club two and a half years. Um, Gabby played a good 10 years in the Premier League and whilst he was a legend on Derby Day 
scored some big goals against other teams. I remember scoring away at Arsenal, away at United and so on. Um, there's a lot of games where he was nowhere near that ability. And I just think it, it's purely down to how many games he played for the Villa. Very quick, very athletic, best years were under O'Neill, um, but it did undo itself towards the end, unfortunately. Best ever uh, goal scoring season in the Premiership was 13. So it's not really mm-hmm. top striker material, but like you say, it was his longevity that got him to that record goal scoring level. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that gets beaten. Another one that kind of that reminds me of is uh, when we had the West Ham special, and then uh, we was told that Miguel Antonio was West Ham's all-time leading goal scorer. That was a massive shock uh, when we did dash that out. So um, yeah, he kind of reminds me of that kind of um, performer where he's just around so so long he manages to uh, pinch a record here and there. Um, yeah, he sort of lost his pace towards the end in his early twenties. Like you said, he was absolutely blistering and he was racking up the goals, but um... Yeah, he didn't make my front two. I put in Watkins. I put him in. I think he's going to have a stellar career, which he's you know already got really. Um, and I put my one of my boyhood favourites, one of the best headers of the ball you'll ever see, Dion Dublin. He's a bit of a legend. I think he got down forty eight goals in his career uh, for oh, for his Aston Villa playing days. So I put him in over York, who I didn't realise scored seventy three goals for Aston Villa in le- in less games. But um, yeah, Dion Dublin. Guess the nod for me, so to speak. What's your so thoughts on? Uh, I'll take any of those. I'm sorry. What's your thoughts on John Carew as a Villa fan? I loved him, John Carew. Absolutely loved him. Um, again, really sort of worn himself to the support in that he got Villa. Uh, uh, Villa's a very funny club. Um, again, a lot of people from the outside in won't know. It, it, it's hard to say it really because we go on about you know we know we're a big club in terms of history and everything else, and we get local teams around here take the mick out of us because historians and whatever else. But you know. The story with Villa is so unique in that they were there from the start in terms of upset the league up. McGregory was part of setting the club up, did what he did. And I feel like Peru was somebody that really immersed himself in the club straight from the off. You know, he, he got the whole 10, got the support, would always celebrate with the supporters, um, had a bit of a cheeky side to him as well. Came in at a point where he's probably what we thought would have been past his best after he'd been at the likes of Valencia and Leon, um, but came in and was phenomenal under O'Neill. And I think that sort of fold of having Ashley Young playing off him, uh, Barry and Co. It was a really, really strong side, but I just think again, another couple of years of him could have been brilliant. It's sort of soured again towards the end when O'Neill sort of phased out. So um, going through those uh, eleven, um, what are your thoughts on some of the world class players? Um, do you th- how many of those eleven do you think have hit the world class level? I think for me, again, some people might argue it, but I think when you look at what Martinez has achieved in the face of what he'd had before, I think to go on and win both international titles with Argentina that you can win. And do that in a side where they have... I don't think people realise the pressure. I've got friends that actually have moved over to Buenos Aires, have worked with football, whatever else. They say over there, you think the pressure is bad here? In terms of the expectation over there for what they want from their players in Argentina, it's a whole new level to the point where, you know, one bad performance, you're almost worried about going out over there. Um, and, you know, he's wrote himself into folklore. No one can take that away from him now. First Villa player to be a World Cup winner. Um, but also to do what he's done, the amount of clean sheets he's had there. Um, he's on track to be our all-time clean sheet holder. I believe it's still Mark Bosnich. He's the fast, uh, most clean sheets in the first 100 appearances for Villa as well, all in short space of time. And again, this is Villa. You know what I mean? We're, we're, we're not Man City. We're not, you know, your Arsenals and other teams that have had all this success, albeit we're having a good year this year. We've had a lot of poor seasons. We've had to come back from the championship and so on. And he's been a part of that journey, trying to rebuild the club. We're now starting to see what he can do in big games and across Europe as well. So I put Martinez in there, definitely. Um, looking at the back line, Lawson, if he'd have stayed fit, I think would have definitely been in there. Probably just misses out because of injuries. Um, Danish fans absolutely loved him. Paul McGrath would be the definite one for me out of the outfield players. Um, we alluded to it earlier on. I think everybody who talks about him, you think if he played for, for Ireland, he could have played for any international team. Field, that's a tough one. I think there's four very, very strong players there. Whether you'd put world class next to them, that's the hard bit. Um, but again, that's the joys of being a Villa fan. We don't get many world class players. Um, Dwight York for me would would get it because of what he did for Villa, what he did for United when he played under Fergie. Um, the York and Cole partnership growing up was just terrifying. Um, any of the current crop of players, um, apart from you know any outfield players, apart from Martinez, on the verge of getting I'd, a world class I'd love, to again. I'd love to do this again in twelve months, like I said, because I think there's going to be a few players in that list that, but depending on how our season carries on panning out. I don't expect us to, I know all these people going, oh, can Villa win the league and whatever else. I'm very much level-headed. You know, I've seen us in the depths of where we've been. If we can stay in the top five or six this season, it would be a phenomenal achievement off the back of last year. 
Um, the run under Emery has been nuts. He's the one standout outfield player for us who doesn't get enough recognition, although he's always linked to Arsenal. Um, Douglas Luiz. Uh, Douglas Luiz is a phenomenal player. Um, you take him out of the Villa team, or if he has a bad game, the whole team, you you, you just notice it. Um, the other one that I think for me is already starting to look like he's fitting in well. Um, he's won trophies elsewhere. Pal Torres, I think getting him in was a masterstroke for memory. He's worked with him before. Certainly didn't expect him to join Villa. I expected him to be going somewhere else. He'd been linked to the likes of Real Madrid um, and other teams in the Premier League. Uh, he's one to keep an eye on. And the other one that I love is Bubikar Kamara. Um, plays in that fiddle next to Douglas Louise. And again, they, they just complement each other so well. I've never seen a player so calm on the ball. Um, in terms of prospects, the biggest prospect we've got coming through, and unfortunately had a bit of an injury at the start of the season, Jacob Ramsey. Um, I know Stephen Gerrard, who we don't want to talk about him too much, but um, I know Gerrard said himself he's one of the best players that he's worked with in terms of up and coming. Sees a lot of traits that he had in himself. Very good at driving the ball forwards and creating, um, but he's still very raw because he's only a young kid. Yeah, definitely. Um... I think um, from your 11 that you selected, Emmy Martinez for me would definitely get the world-class stamp. Um, like you say, uh, winning international honours with Argentina, um, both uh, Copa America and uh, World Cup, you've got to be some player to achieve that. I would argue, you know, they've got Messi, one of the best players of all time, but he's not the same player he was, um, you know, uh, when he when he first burst onto the scene. And I think the reason why he didn't win more with Argentina is because they've struggled with that goal position a long time and uh, Emmy Martinez has come in and not just contributed he's made um, match winning contributions as well I seem to remember in uh, the Copper America as well that he, um, he saved penalties in the penalty shootout in the semi-final or the final as well so um, yeah he's really stepped up and I think you know uh, for goalkeepers I think they peak around 28 they can play right up until they're 40 these days so uh, I think he's got a long time to go at Aston Villa and he can Definitely cement himself if he's if he's not already a club legend. But I think uh, yeah, he's definitely getting that status uh, from the midfield. I think uh, Jack Grealish, whether he you could class him as world class because one of like our parameters is he's got to be over a, p- a period of time. And there's no doubt that what he's done, Aston Villa, bringing him back up from the Championship and um, helping him stay up on was the final and um, going on to Man City, winning the treble. Um, I still think there's more to come from him. Um, yeah, I think he's definitely on that tra- trajectory. And uh, some of the other ones, uh, Milner's a great player. I'm not sure whether you'd call him world class, but probably do a job in any side. So he'd be kind of, he's a top top player. I'm sure, he quite get the stamp. And uh, yeah, just, uh, just uh, mention Gareth Barry, quality player, won everything that he much is doing at Man City. And um, Dwight York, for me, I don't think he did it over a long enough period. Dwight York, but um, that might be a bit controversial. I would say. Yeah. Out of the two, Andy Cole and Dwight York, I thought Andy Cole was the better striker, kind of uh, when he left Man United to radar. But um, yeah, I, I'd say he did it for like a, a, a large portion of his career. But I don't think he's, like if you had world class as the top bracket, it's like one step below that. He quite reached that, but I'm sure I'll upset a lot of Man United fans and probably a lot of Aston Villa fans as well. But um, yeah, um, guys, what do you think of some of the other uh, picks as well there? Um, well, for me. If you win the big one, let's be honest, the World Cup is still uh, still the pinnacle of football. Sometimes players are unlucky with the ball and never going to get to a final. But um, this guy has. He's won, won the big one. He's pulling out some world-class saves for Aston Villa. Yeah, he's won the uh, South American Cup as well. So for me, I'm going to give uh, Martinez a world-class stamp, which, yeah, I can't, I can't see why not. He's... Um, Top keeper, he's got the grit, got the determination, and you know no one can ever take a World Cup win away from him now. So he's got a stamp from me. Um, outfield players, Aston Villa have been, you know, going through some of these these players over the years. You've been, uh, you know, gifted really with the squad you've had, especially that 2009 2010 season. Hopefully, this side currently sticks together, and you can have a, you know, a good run for a couple of years. Hopefully, history doesn't repeat itself with what happened to the. Uh, Matt O'Neill squad, which was was cracking. Um, with any of them world class, no, they've been borderline for me. Some of the some of those players, um, but one on reputation alone, I'll give is Glenn McGrath. You can't have that many oh. ex pros and managers. Paul McGrath, Glenn yeah, McGrath is cricket. Oh, sorry, yeah, Paul McGrath. <laughs> McGrath, Glenn, Glenn, Glenn McGrath is world class. He's world class. He's world class. Yeah, yeah. yeah McGrath. Sorry, <laughs> cool. I've got him down for the. World class stamp because you he reminds me a bit like a Ledley King. 
everyone knows he didn't have much playing time or it, it went through a stage of injuries. Um, but you only have to play a certain amount of times or just turn up on Saturday and be the best player on the park. So for me, there's your second player for the world-class stamp. Dwight York just misses out. I agree with Anton. I think um, Andy Cole was the better better striker there at Man United. And Watkins, you never know. I don't think he can quite meet the world-class standard, but um, he's never, you know, top career. Um, yeah, so those those two for me. Yeah, I'm just on Paul Paul McGrath. I I didn't see enough of him to play, so um, yeah, I I can maybe my own football ignorance there, but I I don't remember that much of him. But um, if you tell me he's uh, one of the top players, then uh, yeah, he'll get the get the honorary stamp from me as well. So, just, um, Steve, how about you? What are your your thoughts on on the eleven? So I'm a little bit older than the uh, the other two panelists, so I I do remember Paul McGrath. I know I look younger anyway, but um, <laughs> I I actually agree. With you, Nick, on your uh, three picks there. Um, Dwight York did it for a good nine or ten seasons in the Premier League, so I, I think he more than qualifies for that world class stamp. Martinez, yeah, what can you, what more can you say about him? Um, I question, well, question for you really. Can you hold on to him? Do you think? Very good question. I think you know you, you mentioned a couple of minutes ago about you know whether we can keep the team together. I think the difference between the O'Neill era we've got. Finance-wise, again, I don't think a lot of people from the outside in realise the finances of the owners at Villa. We, we've got a huge, huge financial backing. Um, both multi-billionaires. Um, Nassif Sawiris is the main majority owner. Um, he's the majority shareholder at Adidas as well. So he's got a lot of sort of fingers in different pies when it comes to sport. Um, those guys, I was fortunate enough to meet them the day that they came in because we were literally, I said it earlier, 24 hours away from being wound up. We're not talking deductions we were 24 hours from being wound up that's how bad the finances were at Villa when we lost to Fulham in the playoff at final before the, the repeat with Derby um, Martinez has got a massive affinity with the club I think it's going to take a hell of a lot of money I was just thinking about Anana while you were talking I think he, he cost something like 45 50 million um, when he went to United and I think to myself if that's what they're paying for somebody who's had a season like he's had how much is Martinez, Martinez worth? And it's how much he's worth to us because we haven't got backup keepers. You know, Robin Olsen, I'm terrified every time he comes on. Um, <laughs> it's how much he's worth to Villa. You know what I mean? And and the good thing is with our owners, you know, I look at when we let Grealish go for 100 million and on the face of it, we were gutted he went. But when I look at what's gone on since he's gone to City, yes, he's won stuff there. Can't argue that. But he's not the player he was when he played for us. And we 100 million to Villa is huge. You know, it's huge to anybody, but 100 million is bought in the likes of the players that we've got in our squad now that are starting to come to the fore in your, you know, your Martinez. We've got Leon Bailey has come in and I was the first one to sort of knock him a little bit last year. Um, didn't think he was doing enough. Emery's come in and he's elevated him to another level in that he's actually contributing and goals and assists are coming in. Um, I just feel the togetherness of Villa is the best it's ever been in the time that I've supported them. All of the players celebrate together. All of the players spend time together. We've got a massive Latin contingent. Um, if you, if, Funnily enough, they're always on Twitch as well. It's quite interesting. You've got um, Dougie Louise, Martinez, Moreno, all of them together, constantly hanging out together, doing live videos together, playing on FIFA and whatever else. And it's, it's different. Is it, I can't put a word on what it is, but there's a different feel down Villa Park. It, it's the most confident I've been as a fan and the fan base have been for an awful long time, probably even more so than when O'Neill was in charge. I'd like to think we can keep him. Yeah. Where do you think you're going to finish this season? Million dollar question. Um, being realistic, there's a lot of big teams in the league. There's teams that have got a lot, lot more sort of power in terms of their 11 was a lot stronger than ours before. I think this week alone has been a big measure. We, we did say before the Spurs game, Spurs, Bournemouth, um, City and Arsenal were going to be a good measure of where we're going to be heading as the season goes on. If you'd have said to me before those four games that we'd have got six points, I'd have been happy. If you'd have told me we're going to get the 10 points out of them, I'd have laughed at you. And I think we're starting to see now the the hallmark of how big Emery is. I don't think, again, people realise the win percentage under Emery. So um, he's been in charge 50, 51 games now. His win percentage at Villa, this is a team that were going down under Gerrard, whatever anybody thinks we were going down. Um, 62.7% win percentage. To put that in perspective, we've not had a single manager in our club's history before um, Emery that was consistently hitting those numbers over that sort of period of time. Um, it's over 12 months. I also saw a stat the other day that um, in the last 10 years of the Premier League, over the first 38 games that Emery had in charge, the points per game would have been enough to finish in the top three in nine of the last 10 seasons. And that's again with a Villa squad that he's inherited that was mainly made up of Dean Smith signings. Again, came from Steve Bruce. Um, Gerard threw a couple of players in there. He's only brought a couple of his own players in to supplement this squad but he's elevating everybody to a different level and everybody's playing their part. So 
I believe top five get Champions League this year if an English team gets to a European final. That's what I'm led to believe. So secretly want to come in the top five. Um, but then it's do we want to win the Conference League versus that's the debate. Do you want to win that or do you want to come in the top five? And I don't think there's a reason why we can't try and do both. And there will be a tipping point where if we do look tired, he goes for one over the other. So I'll go with I'll go with fifth place. I'm going to stick my neck on the line. Go fifth. You, you mentioned yeah, we... about squad size. Do you think uh, Villa will be active in the January transfer market? Notoriously difficult window um, in Villa's history. We're notoriously bad at bringing in duds during January as well. I could do a whole podcast on the worst players to play for Villa. Um, I think right back is a position that we need to strengthen. We've got Matty Cash in there at the moment. Haven't really got anybody that sort of backs him up. Um, they've been drafting Konza to the right-hand side a little bit, but prefer him more central. Um, I still think we're light up front. If anything was to happen to Watkins, it's who then plays centre-forward. Does he bring Diaby in, in as a centre-forward, which Emery did with him at PSG for a short time? Um, we've got John Duran, who's very raw. Um, there's been a couple of questions around his discipline off the pitch, um, but it's finding a striker that's going to be happy sort of coming off the bench, if that makes sense. I don't think you're going to be able to find a striker for a decent cost who's going to be of a similar ability to Watkins that's going to be happy playing second fiddle. That's the difficulty in playing the lone striker. Yeah, and you've got um, Emmy Buendia to come back from injury as well, haven't you? But I don't think until quite late in the season. And he was, oh, both he was playing really well too. Yeah, Buendia and Ming's massive losses. I mean, to lose them both in the first week and a half of the season. Um, they are. And, and this is one thing that we find frustrating as Villa fans. There's been a lot of media clamour around Tottenham and other teams missing players. You look at the four injuries that we've had up until the last couple of weeks. So we had Mings and Wendy are out for the season within the first week, which meant we've had to bring in other people and rely on Carlos coming back, who's been out for over 12 months with an ACL. Um, you had Ramsey out and then he had a reoccurrence of his injury after the Brighton game where he fractured his foot. So he hasn't really kicked a ball much. Um, he's a starting player as well for us. Phenomenal midfielder for Villa. Saniolo hasn't really done it since he's come in. Um, and then Alex Moreno, who was first choice left back for me last year, although Luca Dini has come back in. Uh, we all thought he was leaving and he's done a phenomenal job this year. So we have got players to come back in, um, but the likes of Buendia and Mings, unfortunately, that, that's the gutting thing. You know, we're in Europe. We've come all this way from the championship with Mings and the poor guy's missing out on it this year, which is a, a bit of a gutting one. So um, you've had some great results. How, how did that rate at um, you know, night to Villa Park? Yeah, it's it, it, well, I think we're up to 15 now and it's a, a club record. And again, I think we were all sort of thinking, oh, it's going to end, it's going to end. And then when we got Man City and Arsenal, we were like, well, one of those are definitely going to put an end to it. There's no shame in that. Um, I, I didn't see the performance coming that we put in against City. I thought we'd give them a game. I thought it'd be a close game. Anybody who didn't watch the full 90, we absolutely played them off the park. And, and I'm not exaggerating. I'm not somebody to be like that. I'm the first one to be pessimistic and whatever else. I thought, to a man, there wasn't a player on the pitch for Villa that didn't do a job, even the subs that came on and everything else. Um, it was the most all-round performance that not only I've seen at the Villa in possibly, my, I don't exaggerate, possibly in my lifetime. It was a, And there's a lot of people who've been saying the same who are a lot older than me. They, they were saying that, you know, you, you take into account the opposition you're playing. We talk about world-class stamps, that Man City squad, both on the first 11 and on the bench, you've probably got a plethora that you could give it out to. Um, and a world-class manager as well. And I kind of felt that, because things have been bubbling with them a little bit recently. I was expecting to see a reaction from Haaland. I was expecting to see a reaction from Pep. And seeing the honesty from Pep was quite a refreshing change in that we've had previous issues with him when we've played them. And just, you know, at the end of the game, it's like, you know, they were phenomenal. They played really well. Um, it's probably been one of my favorite, well, one of my best weeks as a Villa fan to, to come out the two games with six points. As I said before, never expected it. I thought Arsenal, much better performance than uh, what Man City put in. Um, were fortunate. 100% on that. I think the penalty, more than fair. A um, couple of dubious moments in the game as well. Um, but I think the fact that we've come out of this week with two clean sheets, I think that speaks for itself as well. It's it's not just winning the games. It's coming out with two 1-0 wins against two Champions League teams who are going to be there or thereabouts, both fighting for the title, particularly getting a clean sheet against City. Um, and the stats in that game as well. I think it was 22 shots. I think City had two shots and their last shot was in the 11th minute. I mean, I don't know anybody who does yeah. that to Man City, so it was. Um, I was. I think that was week. a double chance for Haaland, wasn't it? A header, then a shot straight away, and that yeah. was it. So Martin, yeah. fantastic yeah. by the Villa. <laughs> double lot of smile to your face. <laughs> Definitely against them. We've got, we've got a bit of beef with them, and I think it's because of the. We go back to transfers, and I've mentioned some of those names in the squad. That Villa midfield, other than Ashley Young, our three of them went to City, and then Young obviously went off to United. So uh, we kind of owed them that one for a few years of being hammered by them. But um, yeah, I, th I think it's a really interesting year this year. I don't know about you guys, but if you were to tell me who do you think is going to win the league right now, I've been saying Liverpool for a while because I think they can probably get away with resting a couple of players in the Europa League as opposed to Champions League and find a way to win. And I think some of the players he's brought in, like Gravenbach, 
Um, he's got athletes throughout that squad this year. That midfield's been completely refreshed. But question to you guys would be, who, who would you think would go for the title this year? Difficult. Um, can't rule out Manchester City, but the only thing I'd question is, is maybe no one's ever won four titles. Ago, so is that going to finally catch up? I, I can't really go past uh, Manchester City. Yet. Where do you think Aston Villa are going to finish their land? Aston Villa? Oh, they, I said at the start of the season, in my view, that uh, they could be the dark horses upside. So you can go back and check that one. I did I did actually tip filler for the season. Um, I think anywhere between, it depends really. I think the top three are kind of three. And then it depends whether, um, what happened with Newcastle, what happened with Tottenham. I think they'll be the, but right now, you can't say anyone other than Villa for the fourth place. Um, and I, th- I think they'll do it. I think they'll finish top four season. Um, so yeah, I think they'll finish fourth place. But it'll be very tight. Things could change depending whether Newcastle did the transfer market, got them to the transfer market. So yeah, it'll be tight. But um, yeah, I'll back finish it. The hard one for me is going to be Europe as well. I, th- I, th- I think we've got to try and balance out the games that we've got. And you know, I've, I've just noticed while we're talking, I say Newcastle have just lost, so they're they're out of Europe altogether. Um, so it's fresh legs for them. You know, they've been struggling the last few weeks, and I think the likes of them and Spurs in the back end of the season, you could see a little bit of a surge in that they're going to have fresh legs. They haven't got the European games that. Likes of Villa and other teams are going to have. Um, we were kind of actually hoping for the first time ever. I've never done it before, but was sort of supporting United to get through last night because I was hoping that it would have a bit of an impact on their season, and uh, that didn't happen. Supported Newcastle tonight, and that didn't happen. So, um, big game for us is tomorrow night. We've got um, sorry Thursday night. We've got our last game in the Conference League, and we really need to secure a top spot in the group because if you don't finish top spot, we end up with another two-legged playoff. It's another round of two games with travelling involved, and I just think Emery's doing a great job at the moment of managing the squad with those extra games. I think that was one thing we were all worried about. We probably haven't got out of second gear in Europe. We've been playing and doing just the bare minimum of what we need to do to win games. But compared to what we see on a Saturday and a Sunday, he seems to be finding a way of managing it and getting us through, whether that changes when we get bigger and better teams in that tournament. Um, but yeah, I think I think Spurs and Newcastle are definitely going to be the threats. I think for me, in terms of just answering your question around who I think is going to win the league, um, I can't actually remember who I said at the start of the season. Um, but I'm... well. I think Liverpool, that's, that's my pick because I still feel there's more gears to go with that team. Um, Darwin Nunes, I'm sure he's going to have a purple patch and bang in a few goals. Um, I do like him as a player. He looks he looks a prospect to, uh, yeah, and I think he'll just he'll start banging those goals in. Um, and they've got the experience of, uh, of winning the league as well. I know it was the, uh, the COVID premiership uh, at the time that they won. So, yeah. A lot of people wanted that season to uh, the line drawn under it, didn't they? And, uh, and them not to win it. But um, they'd be my pick. Arsenal, I, Arsenal just don't seem to be anywhere near where they were last season. I know they're still picking up the, the points and, and winning the games, but I just don't see the striker issue is still the issue as it was last season. We don't have a striker to bang in enough goals for me to really take us to that level of winning the Premier League. It's, for me, it'd be a Liverpool City showdown. Um, in terms of Aston Villa's finishing position, I tip them to finish fifth at the start of the season. Um, I'm going to stick with that. I think uh, fifth is um, very doable for Aston Villa. I look at the teams around Tottenham Hotspur, up and down with their form. Um, I mean, what can you say about Man United? I mean, <laughs> who knows what's going on there at the moment. I'm sure they'll have a little purple patch in the season where they'll string a few wins together. Man United, that's what they do. I don't think it'd be enough to, to challenge that top four, though. Um, and I think Newcastle, even if they do um, have those games freed up, um, again, they don't seem to be at the levels they were last season either. So, yeah, Villa fifth for me. And I think Liverpool, Arsenal, City, um, definitely top three. Not sure about the uh, fourth. Yeah, I'm going to go for, um, well, it's going to be tight at the top. I'm going to go with Man City 1-2, but I'm going to ride the crest of the wave with you, Nick. I'm going to push Aston Villa up to third. I think they've got too many wow. midfielders scoring this season. They've got Leon Bailey with five goals, four assists. The Abbey, three goals, four assists. McGinn, four goals, two assists. Douglas Rees, five goals, two assists. You've got goals coming from that centre midfield, literally left, right and centre. If Watkins can stay fit, I think you could... Uh, have a very interesting run at the end of the season. So I think Arsenal haven't got enough grit about them as a side to churn out three points like you were doing last season. Um, Newcastle have fallen off a little bit. I know you said they might be back after being knocked out of Europe, but I think you've got the match on them. You've got a couple of uh, points lead on them. If you keep it going, 
I think you finish in definitely top four, and I'll put you into put you into third. I think you're having probably the best season Aston Villa ever going to have, or you know, at the start of this era with Emery in the top flight. So I'm going to put you third after this week's performances. I think a funny one with the numbers that link into what you've just said. There's, there was a stat that came up just before I actually spoke to you. It popped up on Twitter earlier, and it said, um, in terms of Villa, I mean Villa have been around 140 years or so. Um, they've earned 35 plus points after 16 games in only four previous years. And in those four previous years, I mean, we're talking like 1800s here. And the only other year was the 1980-81 team that won the, the um, European Cup. But in those four years where they've matched the points they got this year, they finished champions in three of them and second in one. So it's a little bit of an omen for you. It's quite a nice one. Um, yeah. We're sort of cling, clinging on to anything that we can at the moment because it's just, it, we, we know as Villa fans, there's inevitably going to be a bubble that bursts at some point. But Emery's sort of history as a manager, you look wherever he's been, he's never really had like a long losing streak anywhere he's been. So I'm just hoping we can find a way to keep the players fit. Yeah, You uh, could do a Leicester, maybe. Yeah, we, we won't talk about that now. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll save that for <laughs> the time. I'm, I'm being very coy at the moment. OK, uh, moving on to uh, the weekend. Brentford you got coming up. Um, how do you think you'll do against Brentford? Uh, Brentford have been one of those sides. We do a weekly prediction. I struggle predicting Brentford. Never know which Brentford's going to turn up. So, um, yeah, how do you feel you're going to do against uh, Brentford this weekend? Difficult game. Um, I think I think it's very similar to when we played Bournemouth away. I think a lot of Villa fans got really excited about the fact we beat Spurs and it was like, oh, well, we should go and walk down to Bournemouth and beat them. And they just come off the back of beating Newcastle. I think Bournemouth are one of the top three or four form teams in the league at the moment and it was a much harder yeah. fixture than we thought. Um, Brentford, I believe we've never beaten them at their place um, in the modern era in terms of Premier League and when we are in the Championship in recent years. Um, always seem to make a real pig's ear of whenever we play them. There were a couple of draws down there. Um, Tony likes scoring against us, but fortunately he's out, and I believe Johan Wiss is still out. So if we are we, we are going to get anything, this is one of the one of the best opportunities we've got of going down there and actually getting something. Although I think they're, they're about seventh or eighth in the home form table, Brentford. They've only lost two at home um, to Everton, and I believe it was Arsenal. So it's not an easy place to go and pick up points. It's a bit of a gritty place. It's quite closed in. If you've you've never been before, you you're pretty much on top of the pitch. It, it's a bit of an odd feeling. Um, on the face of it. I think when you look at the four games we've got coming up, we've got Brentford, we've got um, our two home games over Christmas are Sheffield United and Burnley. So really, you've got to be going for the six points there based on what we've done against other teams. But being Villa, those are the kind of teams that we drop points against. Um, and we've got United away on Boxing Day. And again, I keep saying it to everybody that listens into our podcast or anything else, if we can average close to two points per game, regardless of who we're playing, if we can average close to two points per game over the next four games, we're going to be in that top three going into the new year. Um, this weekend, I would take the draw, um, but at the same time, it's a big opportunity to try and get the win. And that's the thing that Emery does. He doesn't really play to draw, plays to win each time. I think it'll be close game. Um, I'm going to predict a draw, but because if I predict Brentford uh, win, they'll lose. And if I predict Villa win, they'll probably lick that draw and just sit on the fence. Yeah, I, I agree with Anton. Brentford is always a tough one, uh, especially at their place, uh, to predict. So I'm going to... I know those two players are out that you mentioned. Um, I think it's Mbwemo. Also, yeah, I was I was about to say well that the were injured last game. Yeah. yeah, so they're decimated in that forward position, aren't they? So goals will probably be an issue, but I think they can dig out clean sheets. Um, their back four seems pretty pretty solid usually, anyway. So I I think it's going to be a draw as well. But I think you're going to win the next three, pick up nine points out of the next four games, um, and propel yourself firmly into that top three going into the new year and um. Let's see what the teams around start doing. Spurs, United, Newcastle. You know their form isn't great. Um, let's see if they uh, see what they got in the new year. And uh, I think they're your biggest kind of competitors for the, the top four, aren't they? So fingers crossed for you. You keep churning out the points. Yeah, I think I think they'll go down and get a win. Um, you know, toughest game over Christmas. You know, we'll probably be away against United. Um, even though they're in absolute dire straits, they'll probably pull out the, some sort of performance. So. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, definitely, definitely winning on the weekend against Brentford. So, how many points are on your Christmas wish list, Nick? Again, like I said before, I, I, I try to be a little bit more level-headed than your sort of stereotypical fan. That's like, yeah, we're going to win all four, and you know, we're going to win five <laughs> in every game. I think we've got to be targeting the four points at home. I think we four, like, let's say four points, six at six points with the Burnley game, the Sheffield United game. You know, two teams right down the bottom. Villa at home. I mean, in terms of the way we've played under Emery. Last 15 games, one or 15, 39 goals scored. We've only conceded seven with eight clean sheets. We've got to be winning those two games. 
Um, and if we don't win those two games, then you'd start to think, is there going to be a wobble? Um, Brentford, I've said I'd take the point because I know how notoriously difficult it is for us down there along with other clubs. Um, United away, I've got a good feeling about it. Um, but you said about injuries, I think it was quite a shock looking at their bench last night. Um, when you look at the list of yeah. names that were on the bench, I, I didn't really recognise half the names on there. A lot of them were kids that were coming through in a game that they needed to win, um, which in our lifetime, we've, we've never seen that with United. You just expect them to find a way to win with what they've got. Um, but again, it is still Old Trafford. It's Boxing Day. It's it's an eight o'clock kickoff. It's a funny one. Everyone's going to be watching it. Um, so trying to be realistic again, I'd, I'd take a point from both of the away games and try and get those two wins at home. And that would give us that eight points from the four games, the two points per game that I've been mentioning. Well, thanks very much for coming on, Nick. Appreciate uh, your time. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, it's Nick. been really interesting. And like you say, uh, maybe this uh, end of season, we can maybe talk about uh, the last of a pick up any trophies, I'm sure. And maybe some of the current crop of players at the World Class Stamp or make your new 11 at the time as well. Just on the way out, I just want to plug the podcast again and go find you. Yeah, just quickly, thank you to you guys for getting us on as well. I've really enjoyed it. Well, any any excuse to talk football, particularly nostalgia, um, <laughs> stats, anything. I've, I've really enjoyed it. And, it, you know, I listened to the, the West Ham one a few weeks ago. Um, and off the back of that, it's given me a chance to listen to a few more at work over the course of the last few days. And it's definitely something that people need to be subscribing to. So, you know, keep up the good work you're doing. We'll make sure we're plugging you as well, because it's been a really enjoyable night as well. Um, and good luck to all your teams as well. Um, in terms of what we do, you can find us on Twitter at a Villa Fan Pod. Um, that's where we do our live space every two weeks on a Tuesday, which is literally like a football phone in. Um, and we have other bits and pieces on their shirt competitions. We try and give back to supporters as well. Um, people can air their views and say whatever they're thinking about the club at the time. And we feed those directly back to the club with the meetings that we've got. And then our sister page is just at a Villa Fan. And that's more of the written blog content. So match previews, reviews. Um, prediction leagues and those sort of things we try and cover as much as we can well yeah thanks again for coming on if you enjoyed this video please consider dropping a like and if you want to be notified for new videos consider subscribing to channels and you'll be notified when we drop a new video speaking to Matt Letizia we've got three episodes with Matt so that'll be very interesting the very controversial opinions as well um, but that's it for this time guys have a world class weekend and we'll catch you all next time mm-hmm.